and welcome to this Dialogue Web Extra. I'm Marsha Franklin. I'm here with Michael Kirk, producer and director for Frontline since its inception in 1983 and grew up right here in Idaho. I wanted to talk a little bit more about how you choose the programs that you do and how you make them. So first, when you have just this panoply of topics in front of you, how do you hone it down and say, this is the one I want to concentrate on for the next year or two of my life? Um, partly I have a I have a beat in journalism. We have, if you could be a city hall reporter, you could be a state house reporter. Uh, in my case, it's the White House and Washington that I'm most interested in. Uh, I believe that the very best narratives there are in the country that most affect how people live and the quality of their lives come from Washington. Fascinating characters, our president, the people around the president, uh, people who run the Defense Department. Um, fortunately, in the span of my career, starting essentially with Jimmy Carter and going to uh, Barack Obama, there have been unbelievable, and maybe it's always true in America, but I think really unbelievable shifts and changes in the political dynamic of the country, left to right, the emergence of uh, you know Gingrich and others, the Clinton era, the, and I've I've been there for all of them. So in a way, I, I'm always thinking, what can I do? Uh, how can I make four or five films about this particular president that will at some moment allow me to make what we first did with President uh, Clinton, uh, where we did a film with uh, ABC Nightline called The Clinton Years, where we interviewed everybody who'd been around him, pulled together all the stock footage that ABC had and edited together two hours of what happened that, that aired right before Clinton left office. Uh, we did the same thing with George Bush called Bush's War, which we just focused on the ways that he as president and the people around him, the five or six characters around him, Condi Rice and, and George Tennant and Colin Powell and Don Rumsfeld and Dick Cheney, all influenced uh, uh, the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq really his legacy, because what they were really about was executive power, which I'm incredibly interested in. And then the Obama right. uh, you'll do uh, that, presidency, then you'll do and then I'll do sum up. a sum up on him. And I have really one, only one more Obama story to tell, which is the story I'm working on now, which is uh, the secrecy, the drone war, the arresting uh, uh, leakers, uh, all of that that was not part of what we thought we were getting when we uh, elected Barack Obama. Uh, and, uh, and, and what we've gotten in the national security front uh, is fascinating territory, and I haven't really explored it the way that, that uh, I will now for the next eight months. You don't live in Washington, D.C. You live in the Boston area. Thank God. So how does that affect your ability to get the sources you need and uh, keep your ear to the ground on, on these issues? I think we're known uh, in Washington by the people we need to know to plug in. We also use inside our films a kind of cast of, it's like a Greek chorus, a cast of journalists who who Martin. I've learned to trust and and follow as they report. So uh, Peter Baker from the New York Times is a, is a regular. We call him up every once in a while and once every year or two. We debrief him on what he saw inside. Uh, Ryan Lizza from uh, mm -hmm. The New Yorker, fantastic storyteller and observer, uh, and, and almost everybody in Washington who emerges, Dana Priest, Dana Priest for, mm -hmm. for sure, uh, somebody I, I, I trust uh, incredibly in the national security area. Um, so we have a kind of regular set of eyes and ears on the ground there, in addition to our own reporting, and, uh, and we keep track of issues. And I, if I was in Washington, I don't think I would see it as clearly as I can by stepping back. Boston's a wonderful uh, place. I'm, I'm close enough that I can be in Washington in 45 minutes on, on an airplane. I'm there a lot. Uh, uh, and when we shoot a film, I, I've already sort of figured out what the big narrative is, what the meta story is, and uh, in we go to grab the interviews with everybody who will talk to us. Increasingly, uh, th that's harder to do with the Obama White House, which I think is the most I, I think people say this about every presidency, but this is, without question, the most locked down White House 
I've ever been around, ever seen, and I think every reporter in Washington would say the same thing. It is very, very, very hard to get them to reveal almost anything. It's harder than it was to get Dick Cheney to do it, harder than it ever was with the Bush administration, so, uh, or even the Clinton administration when they finally came to, by 96, hate the press uh, as much as it is possible to hate the press. I think the Obama administration has taken it to a complete other place where sources are afraid to talk, reporters are afraid to receive information from people for fear that they'll be arrested or indicted or that their sources will be indicted. It is a true climate of fear in reporting in Washington uh, uh, many of the kind of investigative things that I have uh, an interest in trying to find out. It is harder and harder and harder to get that information. We get it, but it's not easy and I think increasingly treacherous. And that will be the subject of your next uh series of documentaries, it sounds uh, like. Are you going to work on The Choice again? You Every four years you tip, tend to work on, you uh, have the, the, worked the, on the, the woven biographies the, the of the biographies two candidates. The candidates, yeah. yeah. I, I, I really like it. I always say this is the last one I'll do. <laughs> so I started with Bush and Gore and then uh, moved along. I, I, I missed Kerry and whoever Kerry ran against. Sorry, oh, George W. Bush. But uh, uh, that was the only one I missed and I'm thankful that I missed that one. And uh, and I, you know what, the great thing about doing it is you really get to know the candidate because they are the character. It's not just a puff piece biography. It is a real, and, and they have an interest in talking to you because they're running for the presidency and the choice is a very prestigious film for them to be in. And they know that while it doesn't determine the outcome of elections, it is an important thing that runs in October right before the election. And, and by getting to know a president and, uh, or a, a wannabe president, uh, and their staff, you get to know that first round of people who will work around him and eventually her. You don't, uh, you, you're not sure whether you're going to do that. I, you know, sounds like you're going to have your hands full with the. Uh, well, the the secrets secrecy. film will will air in uh, in this March or April or May, so I'll be done with that, and I may throw a football film in between <laughs> now and then, just because there, I'm very. A follow up to, to be, what happened. Well, I'm really interested in the settlement and why that happened the way that it happened. Uh, so it seemed we're very interesting on. to me that ESPN pulled out, then the settlement happened. It was almost as if they knew it was going to they, they They knew, and I think the film is having, the uh, League of Denial is having, I mean, every day I get more stories that are being written in towns and communities all over America, hard stories, investigative stories about what's happening in football in their towns and complaints about the National Football League. I mean, I realize it's, uh, it's just journalism, but I think if we can keep pushing in that area, maybe new people and new information will come forward, and, and, and the settlement certainly seems to be an interesting piece of territory. I don't know that we'll actually do it, but I think somebody, us and ESPN and others, I hope, will continue to push on, on what happened and what we've uncovered because I think it is important, and I think the audience numbers, which were phenomenal uh, for that film, have uh, demonstrated to us that there is a real appetite uh, to understand what football uh, can do to your child. And what, it that, went up over a, 2 million viewers? It's 2.2 million, but yeah. I think it's going to be, some, somebody told me it will be much higher than that when the real ratings come out okay. in about three or four weeks. So there's an overnight rating, mm -hmm. which is still 2.2 million, it was very good. 351,000 hits on the web, I think that night and the next morning. So a lot of people very interested, and it's been rolling now for almost, uh, uh, for a few weeks. So it'll be, It'll be substantial when it's all when the numbers are finally all put together, and uh, and, and w while that's important, it's also a, a hopeful sign that maybe others will begin to report it as well. And if we can help by doing something, uh, I think I think we'll tr we may try to do it. I, I don't know. So it's not always Washington stories that you're attracted to, obviously. That's but but not mostly, a, that, yeah, mostly, almost Washington, always. always. I, I really feel it is my job that. There's not, there's not a lot of serious long-form documentaries being made in the country, so I feel like it's my responsibility, and, and Frontline certainly feels that way, to, uh, because I'm interested in those big narratives about the White House and about the Congress. Uh, uh, it's, I, I think it's, it's essential that we do it. It's a responsibility to do it. It's not always as sexy as the football film, but it's, uh, it's equally important and challenging and fascinating to me. I, I, I love 
thinking about Barack Obama and what he does and why he does it and John Boehner and Mitch McConnell and all well, of them. The shutdown very interested. that we happen to be in while, while yeah. you and I are talking has so many, it's so character driven. I mean, Absolutely. So character -driven. And we made this film in uh, uh, March, I guess it aired, or maybe late, maybe February, called Cliffhanger, which was really the prelude and all the background to what's happening now. And uh, John Boehner gave us, I think, the first and most substantial interview he's ever done uh, on television. And it, it's, it, it, it's, it's amazing what's happening to American government and the Congress and the, uh, the influence of the Tea Party, the, the sort of ineffectiveness of the Democratic Party, the president being where he is and his staff, and that Washington could find itself now, uh, at least as we're talking now, right on the edge of a, of a debt ceiling kind of meltdown, uh, the economy again in some peril perhaps, and that that could all be happening because Washington has, is broken in some fundamental way. They're not talking to each other. And the basic rules of the road that Republicans and Democrats all could kind of agree on, which is, well, we won't ever drive it off the cliff. I mean, we'll have arguments. We'll call each other names. There will be precipice moments. But we will never drive it off the cliff. I think the great eye-opener for John Boehner back when we made the film in February of 2013 was, oh my God, there are people in my caucus who are prepared to do that. And that is amazing. It's like parents who say, whose children finally say, I'm not going to obey a single yeah, thing you do. Yeah, it does remind me of, of that. Yeah, it's it's a scary moment. What do you do? How do you? Children. Yeah. Um, and, and another story that, or character part of it that I find interesting are the women or particularly the, some of the female senators who are talking Absolutely. about this I issue. And I know you tend to see a lot of these stories in Shakespearean terms or... Or biblical terms. Biblical terms or right. Greek, you know, exactly. ter terms. You, you have a sense of how this falls in the compendium of classics. Yes. Shakespearean, Homerian, <laughs> well, Odyssean. <laughs> if, if football was David and Goliath, then many of my films are straight out of the Bible in lots of ways. Uh, there are always David and Goliath subplots. There was a, a film I made called The Warning about Brooks Lee Bourne, an unbelievably wonderful uh, uh, woman who warned about uh, derivatives long before and the, and the, the, the White Men's Club of uh, Alan Greenspan and Arthur Levitt and, and uh, Larry Summers and young Tim Geithner shut her down at the time as she was warning and we had what we had in 2008. Uh, it's the same kind of David Goliath moment. There's also a little bit of, as you suggest, there's a little bit of Macbeth going on in Washington right now. It, 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 is, it is pretentious sounding, but somebody told me many, many, many years ago, all great stories have their roots in the great stories of the Bible, the great stories of Shakespeare, and uh, and maybe Greek tragedy. Uh, a, a, and and I spend a lot of time when I have a lot of time uh, talking to and uh, scholars about those topics, about those uh, the Bible and 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 most of Shakespeare. I try to read it. I try to think about it. Uh, not always successfully, but I, but I, there is inside those stories the great human dramas and tragedies, and almost every story uh, in government or what's happening in the world can be uh, not reduced but uh, held up against the structure of one of the great biblical tales or one of the great Shakespearean stories. It's just the trick is finding out which one it is. That's why it's so important, isn't it, as a journalist to, to read, just to simply read. It's a great, read, there's, there's no substitute history. for a great liberal arts education. I, I, I went to the University of Idaho and you could say, well, why didn't you go to Stanford or Harvard or whatever? There were a few people up there who pushed a little button and whatever that button was, it woke up and, uh, and it, it helped me a lot in an environment where I'm not so sure I would have done very well in one of those other pressure cooker kind of places. I needed a little room to grow and learn at my own the pace and I, and I was lucky enough to get to and to follow that model all the way through my career. And it's, you know, it is true that you need, you need guideposts, you need um, an education, even if it's a, a personally gathered education. I went to Harvard 
for, uh, as a, on a fellowship, on a Neiman fellowship when I was in my late 20s, early 30s, early 30s, I guess. And, uh, and I spent a year thinking about things like there was actually a class there called Shakespeare in the Bible. So suddenly, you know, the scales are lifted from my eyes and I'm beginning to hang around with people who I don't really understand everything everybody's saying, but I'm catching up as fast as I can. And I learned about myself that uh, I'm very interested in knowledge for its own sake, not to get an A or a B or a job, but literally to know it so that I could make some kind of contribution uh, to the world as a storyteller, which is all in the end I really am. With 24-hour news channels, with the way that media has changed uh, since you started, since even I started, there isn't much time for a lot of journalists to sit and read and think. And uh, in my view, I guess, the output reflects that. Uh, we could have an hour-long discussion about how things have changed. But you've, you've, you've seen a lot. And, um, yeah. and Frontline has, you know, I'm not good with boat analogy, but it's, it, the mast is still there. I mean, it's, it's, yeah. it, it has stayed amidst all of this change. I mean, you've had to, you've had to um, develop a website and other ways of getting in the fact, story out, but what your mission is is essentially the same. Yeah, we've, in fact, embraced the web and Twitter and lots of other things because they are, after all, communication devices uh, designed to augment. We were the very first. I think we've, we've tried to find out whether this is actually true or just a fact too good to check, but I think we were the first <laughs> deep, uh, deep content website around a film I made uh, called uh, uh, Waco the Inside Story uh, and so we had this thing called the web we had a website which we were using for promos or for prom promotion basically four people probably looked at it and uh, we just decided we had all these transcripts and all these tapes and all the audio tapes and we just put them on the web and suddenly people were coming and we decided well our, journal our journalism should be as transparent as possible and uh, that was the beginning of, of the Frontline website which scholars and other people who are doing journalism regularly access. I don't know how many people I interview who say, when I wanted to know, or when I was writing my book, or when I was thinking about this, I went to the Frontline website and I looked up uh, all the films, 600 films, and all the information that was available. I mean, it is itself a kind of library, as, as I say, of, uh, of modern American history, starting back with R Reagan. What has happened to journalism, uh, uh, broadcast journalism especially? I, ca I can't really speak to newspapers, although I'm sorry that it's, it's it, I, I read The Statesman this morning in about five minutes, and I was trying to read everything. And it was uh, the, the, the great joy of living in Boston is I can read The New York Times, I can luxuriate with a printed copy of The New York Times on Sunday and spend three or four hours reading the newspaper. I can read six papers a day on the web now, which is what I have to do, but they aren't what they used to be. In some ways they're better, but in some ways, in most ways, they're not. Television, broadcast journalism, I feel so sorry for highly educated people. They go to Harvard, they go to Chicago, they go to University of Missouri Graduate School, they go to Stanford, they go to very good schools. They aspire to get into journalism to do good things for society. Uh, maybe also they think they're going to make some money, which is absolutely a misnomer nowadays. And uh, there you are, you're, you're in this world with all the aspirations you can imagine and the things you're asked to do, the humiliations of having a minute 10 to tell a, a very important story or something that you find out, the worry about how you look, the shooting and reporting at the same time. The, the great luxury I have at Frontline and the great luxury I've managed to have almost all my career are, is the luxury of time. Time to research, time to shoot something. I can shoot for 30, 40 days on a film, right? I can. I have the time to interview somebody for two and a half hours long. If I want to do 40 interviews, well, then I'll do 40, two and a half hour interviews. The time to edit it, eight weeks, 12 weeks, 14 weeks, you know, and as much time and energy as I can muster, I often work 16, 18 hour days right, for I those mean, let's, weeks. Let's just stop there. You're often working 16, 18, 20 hour days. I think that's important for people to know. Yeah. Is it, it's a profession that takes time and energy, no matter where you are in your career with it. Exactly. It's, there's a lot of time into it. Well, yeah. it's, and it's time, and it's, it's in some ways thankless time, because it's, uh, if you believe Malcolm Gladwell, about 10,000 hours of, I think it's 10,000 hours to perfect something or be really good at something. It's been, it took about 10,000 hours for me to, to get, I, I, I think, as capable 
as I finally have gotten, but I, I'm never satisfied. I don't really believe that I'm, I'm, I'm done or even close to done. I'm constantly worrying about it, thinking about it. I'm probably unbearable to live with. I just, literally, I'm committed to it all the time. And it's, uh, it's uh, uh, every story, every interaction, sitting on a plane next to somebody, I'm pulling information out of people all the time. It's, uh, it's uh, people always ask me, so what's the number one criteria? What's the most important thing to be if you want to be you? And I say, curious. Yep, curious. You, know, you have to be curious about it. If you're everything. a reporter, you're always a reporter. It doesn't matter whether you're on the, in the building or not. Oh, absolutely. You're always a reporter. Absolutely, absolutely. You know. The final part of time that matters about public television, by the way, the short commercial for public television, is the opportunity to have it not air for five minutes or seven minutes, or si the classic 60 minutes piece, I think it's 12 minutes long, uh, to have 52 minutes to tell a sort of important story, allows you to have an epic narrative arc, That's a, right. me a meta story, a thing that you can, develop all the way through in a three-act structure. It's fabulous. And there have been times at Frontline where I've walked out of a rough cut where I've shown David Fanning, the famous legendary executive producer, a cut that, in the case of Bush's War, it was a two and a half hour rough cut. It's before it's all cleaned up, it was two and a half hours long. And he walked out of the room and said, I'm gonna call PBS and say, we need two and a half hours for the first night of what I hope will be two more hours next week. And I said, four and a half hours? And he said, it deserves it. And I said, well, I could probably make the two and a half hour show two hours long. And he said, but by cutting it down, you will lose the rhythms and the discoveries, the little discoveries along the way that build. And that's not only David's a great genius, but it's also a wonderful thing about time in public television. So time to research, time to shoot, time to edit, and then time for the broadcast where it can actually uh, live whatever life uh, the story requires. That's, a, that's an amazing and rare thing on American broadcasting now where it's just all, uh, as you said, Marcia, little bits of information between the commercials that just keep you going so you'll watch the commercials. I mean, I think it's, I can't, I haven't watched local television news or even network nightly news in 10 or 15 years. I just, I'm not a consumer of that anymore because it's just maddening how bite size it all is. And I feel sorry for people who've had a great education, have worked hard, have wanted to you know, aspire to do something important with their broadcast journalism degree or career or aspiration, only to be thwarted by uh, working in places where you know, it's a, you're selling used cars. It's not good. And we should say you don't watch other documentaries or films while you're working on your own I either. I can't, it just, it would, it, it, in, it infects me and invades me in some way that I, it's, it's very hard and I know, I know many, many very important filmmakers and I, I applaud and encourage their careers and their success and all of it, but it's just very, very, very hard for me. I, I, have, a, I have a kind of idea about what a film should be, what my film should be and I, it's like, I don't want, I live in my own world and, it, and somebody told me a long time ago a very important thing, only really one person or one sensibility can make a film. And if you're watching others, especially others who've worked inside the territory, suddenly you don't know why, but it's getting a little derivative. And you've got to hear the voice inside your own film. And I often, when I write a film, when I'm writing every, I get up at 3.34 in the morning, every morning, and I work very hard till about eight or nine, then I go to the gym, then I edit until six or seven at night. When I'm writing the script for that day's work, I'm often listening to the same cut of Miles Davis over and over and over again in my ears so that the rhythm of this film matches the rhythm of the last film and the last film. And that rhythm happens to coincide with Will Lyman, the great frontline narrator's cadences and his voice, which adds a whole other dimension to any film you make for frontline. So it's, it's, there's a lot of little games I play, and one of the games is I don't watch other people's work. When I'm done, I can go back and watch it, or at the very beginning when I'm researching, I can see everything that I need to see in order to understand who else has covered whatever we happen to be doing. But in, in the main, I don't, and certainly from essentially the moment I push go, I'm not watching anything else. We hope you keep pressing go and hearing those voices, hearing your voice, yeah. uh, and finding that narrative thread. 
have really enjoyed talking with you. I suppose I should have Thank run you. upstairs and said, I need an hour. <laughs> you do. <laughs> I'll call David Fanning up That'd and be say, good. I need an hour say, with I'll call Cooper. PBS for Not you. Not half an hour, an hour. <laughs> yeah, well, he's heard all this before. He wouldn't agree. <laughs> He'd say a half hour is plenty. Well, Thank you for the time that you spent both in the main program and this Web Extra You're talking with welcome. me. I appreciate it. Sure. You've been listening to Michael Kirk. He is a producer and director with Frontline. He's been with the program since its inception in 1983. Thanks for tuning in.